Mm -hmm. Hi there. Hello. How's it going, Micah? Uh, it's pretty good. I love black cats. Yeah, you know, it's great. I've heard that they're always the last to get adopted at shelters because they don't photograph well in photos, you know, advertising. This could be your cat. All you can see is eyes, right? Yeah, I've actually had a bit of problems with that. I like to take pictures of them. Uh, he had a cousin, uh, and I took a couple of pictures of uh, his cousins, and they those were really good. I liked it. Uh, yeah, I wonder if you photographed against a white background, then the black cat would stand out, right? We have like screens here. So uh -huh. when they were resting on the screen, like the screens are weird, like they catch the light uh -huh. and they show up. So yeah. I couldn't, so when I took the picture, it looked like it was sort of like a weird lit background and also for uh -huh. sort of fluoresces and stuff. Oh, I love that. That's great. Huh. Yeah, really cool. Well, feel free to ask me anything. I'll answer anything. Okay. Yeah, that might actually be a good way to start it. Yeah. So how much of the book is based on your personal experience and how much of it was just sort of, I don't know if made up is the right term, but yeah, constructed out of like extrapolation? I don't know. Yeah, no, sure. That's a great question. And actually, nobody has asked me that. Thank you. Uh, I'm very familiar with where I set the book, although I didn't say it outright. It's set in Ventura, California, where mm -hmm. I grew up. Uh, I don't know if you know Southern California, but it's between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. And it's a pretty lovely place to grow up. Um, all the parts about cross country and track are true. I was, uh, I was a track star when I was in um, my freshman and sophomore year of high school, not so much in middle school. Um, I do have a lisp. It comes out more when I'm tired or when I've been talking. Uh, the parts about my brother, my, my brother does have Down syndrome. He's my younger brother. Um, my beloved mother was incredibly overprotective of him, even though she really believed in full inclusion. She also was terrified that he was going to get hurt, abused, and so absolutely no social media. Um, she is really the inspiration for, for Sorrel's and Daisy's parents. Um, she really took a hard line, absolutely no exposure, although she would let him appear in the, news, in the newspapers for Special Olympics. I'm trying to think of what else we had. Oh, we had a giant white house rabbit when I was writing the book and when I was revising the book and when it was going to print, our bunny died of, of a fly strike, which is a, a horrible disease. And then other than that, I guess that's about it. Um, there's a performance near the end of the book of uh, Indian dancing. And one of my daughter's friends held a benefit for her relatives in Kerala, India, uh, in that way. So I stole that. Oh, and one more thing. The teacher, Mr. Coach Lipinski, yeah. is based on one of the teachers at my daughter's middle school. And so far, he hasn't found out. <laughs> but he will. He will. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, that was actually part of my two sort of next questions in specific. Uh, were there any people in your current or adolescent life that inspired people like Miguel, Poppy, Devin, or Mr. Lipinski? Um, yeah, so again, Mr. Yeah. Lipinski is, I mean, I don't know this teacher well, but what I know of him, he's super cool. He wasn't my daughter's teacher, but I worshipped him from afar. So he is definitely the inspiration for Coach Lipinski. And then the others, I mean, there's a lot of me in Daisy. There's a lot of my brother, Mark, in Sorrel, Squirrel. Um, and the peacock car is inspired by a peacock car that an artist friend of mine drives. And it's an art car that she painted herself. Other than that, um, no, I, I didn't take anybody else except for the rabbit from Direct Life. Okay, and then, sorry about this, uh, oh, furthermore, no, was was the project that was the basis of the story's conflict, 
based on anything that you had or maybe your daughter had? I made that up. I made that up because I I started looking at, maybe I read an article in a kid's magazine about tweens that were changing the world. And I, I had never realized that people as young as eight years old can just wake up one day and say, I want to start a nonprofit to help the homeless people on the streets so that they have toiletries and snacks. I never realized an eight year old could be that ambitious and visionary. And the more I read about kids from eight to 18, um, just launching these kinds of projects as entrepreneurs, um, fighting for social justice, it, it just knocked my socks off. I feel like, especially in the pandemic, kids felt so disempowered. They felt like, you know, I'm, I'm beholden to screens. I can't even see, I can't even go outside in some cases. Um, I just, I just loved the idea of empowering young people to change the world for the better. I feel like my mom, when I was growing up, always made me feel like I could do that. And so I started working on social justice issues pretty early on and just kind of wanted to share the love. Yeah, uh, actually speaking personally, I recently had a social studies project that was pretty similar, but the teacher didn't have enough time to put it together so we couldn't really do anything. Apparently in the past, uh, the pro people who've done that project like uh, had enacted, had like actually started bills that got uh, feminine hygiene products like mandated to put in bathrooms for public schools. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Wow, I did want to give kids a blueprint. So, you know, Coach Lipinski has that B-A-R-A-T acronym. Don't, don't ask me to remember what it stands for right now. <laughs> Brainstorm. But I brainstorm. Uh, <laughs> something, something, something. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I know T was triumph. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to give kids um, a blueprint for for how they could go about creating an actionable project that could change the world for the better. Because you can do it on such a local level as well. Even if you just want to, um, as I have, put on an inflatable T Rex costume and fill little free libraries, which I did last Christmas. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's actually, like the little, uh, like, uh, what are they? Sorry, I don't remember the exact name. We don't really have them here, but um, I remember seeing them a lot in California where they were like uh, the little like corner side libraries with yeah. all the books. Yeah, yeah little cool free books. libraries. Yeah, why don't you have them there? I don't know. It's, reading here is, it's weird. I don't know. Reading is a lot less sort of, I don't know. It's weird. Even a lot of kids in my honors classes for English have said that they don't really like reading. Yeah. Reading's bit, reading's a bit of like a, not taboo. It's, it's less encouraged. I don't really know how to say it. It's, yeah. it's not as common. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I think smartphones have really taken the place of books. Yeah, and not Even just for young reading, people. <laughs> I, I like reading, but sometimes I just want to veg out and listen to random videos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, moving on. Uh, what actually inspired you to write the book? Sorry, uh, whiplash. <laughs> yeah, sorry. What inspired me? Yes, okay. So I, I had to think about that. Maybe four or five years ago, I read a story in the local paper that said that the Oregon chapter of Special Olympics had to cancel their summer games because of lack of funds. Since I had grown up watching my brother in Southern California, you know, doing every Special Olympics sport that he could possibly fit into his packed schedule, with the hope of competing in summer games, I realized what a blow this was to people in Oregon. And so I thought, what would that be like if you, um, you know, if you had been training and, and then you didn't have summer games? And I think around that time, his girlfriend broke up with him. I think she said he was boring. And so he was devastated. And his devastation combined with Oregon canceling their games 
kind of gave me this idea for the book, actually. <laughs> and I think somewhere in there, I had seen this really embarrassing uh, truck driving through the streets of Eugene, Oregon, and realized it was a dog poop removal service. So I knew I had to get that in there. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah, uh, public funding is... <laughs> It's unfortunately not very strong for certain things. Yeah. And it's really annoying to me. Yeah, I try to write, uh, you know, I'm a journalist as well. So I try to write a lot of articles and a lot of profiles of people who compete in Special Olympics so that the general public realizes what a big deal it is. I mean, there's somebody competing next June, Chris Nickich was the first man with Down syndrome to finish an Ironman triathlon. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could do an Ironman triathlon. And, and I want people to realize people with Down syndrome are accomplishing incredible things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think I could do that either. It's, no way. Uh, yeah, it's the swim me, but I, Yeah. Swimming alone, definitely. <laughs> Maybe the run, maybe the run, but not all three. Yeah, I could do the run and the bike, but I'm telling you what, the swimming would kill me. <laughs> yeah, I can barely get around a swimming pool. I <laughs> honestly super shameful. I live in Hawaii. We have all of the reasons in the world to swim, but I I was gonna didn't. ask. <laughs> Is the water really warm there? It really depends where you go. Uh -huh. Like we have this one place called Ice Pond. It's a really popular hangout spot, but it's like freezing cold. It's like you just jumping into a pool of ice water. What? But then like there's like right near it, there's uh, Onikaakaha, which has really warm water. It's, people even joke that it's really warm because all of the kids pee in it. <laughs> It's a really popular kids hangout spot because it's got um, blocked off waters. Wow. So it's really safe for small kids. Yeah, there's, it really varies. And then there's this one beach, Four Mile, which is like some parts are freezing and then some parts are actually fine. It, most of the freezing parts are fresh water that like gets pumped in from like restaurants and stuff. Really? Yes. Yeah, oh, that's fascinating. Huh. Hmm. I've never heard of that. It's just cold here in Oregon. It's just universally freezing. Yeah, I don't think it ever gets to wetsuit temperatures. I remember back in Northern California, if you wanted to swim in the beach, you had to have a wetsuit. You have to, um, yeah. But um, yeah, here it never really gets to wetsuit temperatures. It's just like- huh. Yeah. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, looking back, how do you feel about the novel? Like, uh, do you really like how the novel was written or do you feel like, sorry. Yeah. I No, that is a great, you're coming up with really smart questions. I, I really like this novel. Um, you know, my previous novel, Avenging the Owl, also has a main character with Down syndrome. And it has uh, the protagonist's father attempt attempt suicide. He's clinically depressed. And that alone got that book, not banned, but some teachers and librarians decided attempted suicide of a parent was too heavy for middle schoolers. So that was problematic. I don't feel like there's any scene like that in Daisy Woodworm Changes the World. I mean, I know that a character has two moms. And so maybe in Florida, you know, the governor is going to come unglued. But other than that, I really like the book. And there are two things that I wish I had fought harder for when it was going to print. First of all, you know how Daisy's father makes gingerbread bunnies, gingerbread rabbits. I had the recipe in there and the editor took it out. I think they were trying to save space. That's a darn good recipe. The other thing is periodically as Daisy and Miguel and Squirrel discover different famous people who have Down syndrome. I had all sorts of profiles of these people, just short page long profiles, um, periodically scattered through the book so people could start understanding all the accomplishments that people with Down syndrome have made. 
and they cut those as well. They said it broke up the flow of the narrative and, and maybe it did, but I do wish those had stayed in and I've got to figure out a way to get those out to readers. So if you have any ideas, let me know. Yeah, that's a that's a real shame. Uh, I noticed in the back there was uh, just like a list of yeah. people. Yeah, that I'm assuming that's how you tried to get it in anyways. Well, yeah, in some ways. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to give readers resources in case they use the book for a book report or, you know, in case they know somebody with Down syndrome or they have a sibling with Down syndrome or, you know, in my kids' case, an uncle, there were resources for that genetic condition as well as resources for, I think, running and I think there's even insect resources yeah, in there. There's one of those like, eating bugs for breakfast and how it could like say- That's a good the... book. That is such a good book. <laughs> Have you ever eaten a bug? Uh, yeah, actually one time we were traveling in Cambodia, I believe, and we, we because like it was basically like, you just stop on the side of the road to get a big bag of grasshoppers. And yeah. our taxi driver actually did. We, he was just like, okay, stop, sorry. I gotta stop by for some bugs. And we we're just like, Let's do it. How were they? Uh, I remember they were pretty good. Uh, my brother sort of freaked out about them because, ew, bugs. But I was like, mm, bugs. <laughs> were they salted? Did they have like... Yeah, they were like with like chili lime and stuff. They were pretty good. Good for you. <laughs> it's interesting because you got it like you hold it by the leg and then you just eat the body. It's weird. Yeah. Where's, yeah, the you hmm? Where's the head? Where's oh, the head? You eat the head. You eat the head. So you don't eat the leg or you do eat the leg? I don't think, I don't remember eating the leg. I feel like this is on my bucket list now. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting. I remember one time also we went to New York and they had like little boxes of like bugs. They were a lot more like flavored and very clearly made for a more American palette where they were like hidden bugs like they coat the bugs in like chocolate and cheese flavoring ew yeah it's weird they you know weren't this, <laughs> you know what this reminds me of this is kind of an old book now but did you ever read the how to eat fried worms I don't believe I have that was a great book that's very like sixth grade fifth or sixth grade it's perfect for those those kids it was a great book yeah. Sounds interesting. Maybe I'll uh, try and find it for my sister. Well, uh, how old's your sister? Uh, she's around fifth or, th fifth or sixth, sixth grade. I'm sorry. Uh, I Yeah, sixth grade. How yeah. to eat fried worms. Remember it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, moving on. Uh, what was, I think you've talked about this a bit about this, but yeah, what was your target audience? Yeah. Oh, good question. So, yeah. Well, obviously middle schoolers. But also anybody from, say, the ages of 10 to 14, um, as well as adults who enjoy reading middle grade fiction, because there's actually a lot of adults that like, that prefer to read books for kids. And then as well, any special education teacher or therapist working with um, the intellectually disabled population, and especially kids who are growing up with a sibling who has Down syndrome or another intellectual disability like that. I just wanted to assure them that they are heard and their stories are being told. Because when I went to look for books with protagonists who have Down syndrome, I found three. And I don't think that's okay. Um, I think yeah. it's one, one in 700 people is born with Down syndrome, I believe. Where are the books that reflect that? And and I have a theory about where why those aren't being published, but I just I really wanted to put those out there. Yeah, definitely. There's a major lack of a lot of representation in yeah. a lot of media. Uh what was it? Sorry, I can't think of a lot of numbers right now, but it just representation is at a rate where it should be higher, but nope, they want to write another story about Jack Smith, Mr. White Everyman with a with a bit of a shadow and 
Oh, tragic past, and oh my god, it's such a new character, wow. Right. Hey, what what book would you love to see that hasn't been written yet? What character, what setting, what plot line? I don't know. I've always really liked sci-fi. Sci-fi uh -huh. is my jam. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I I mostly just read books that are like, uh, what was it? Either I'll get recommended them. I had this one book that was gifted to be my family friend and mm -hmm. I started reading it and I really like it. Uh, yeah. Murderbot. It's a bit more on the probably reading level is more, uh, I it, it's hard for me to categorize reading level because yeah. I was reading like Lord of the Rings in fourth grade. So oh my gosh, <laughs> really? Kind of hard for me to like classify reading level. I yeah. don't know high school reading level but yeah. like top maybe a bit closer to like the more adult side of the young adult you remind it's really me so listen to this you know the martian the book by oh Andrew. yeah what's the newest book uh project hail mary right so i, I gave it. it to my husband i was really excited to give it to him he really didn't like it he couldn't figure out why and last week he he figured it out. I guess maybe the New York Times ran it through a, a reading level generator and found that it was written at a third grade reading level. <laughs> that's that's really interesting. Yeah, the that definitely does seem like it would maybe throw someone off. Like this is written at third grade level. Maybe I'd actually be able to understand it. <laughs> I, I find sci-fi difficult, but maybe I better check this one out. <laughs> yeah, I I really, like I said, sci-fi is my jam. Yeah. Uh, that actually kind of reminds me. Um, I remember I was using this uh, website for a school. Like they had like a required reading where like you had to read like 20 minutes or something every week for on this one program or was it 20 minutes a day? I don't know. But yeah, you'd have to read this much on a day and it had to be at your reading, this quantified reading level is Lexile and, yeah. or above. Yeah. Uh, and it was really a shame because I had like such a high reading level, which means <sighs> a lot of the books that were at or above my level were like really boring. Yeah. The, one that I, the only one that I actually kind of liked was the Iliad. Wow. But like, I wanted to see if I could read Dune because uh, I got really excited because like, you know, the movie and I was like, why not read it for school? Right. And so I looked it up and it turns out that it was like at a 800 when I was like at 1800. Oh gosh. <laughs> and I was like, wow, what's the deal with that? This is like such an old classic that's like very complex and it's always, whenever I've heard about it, it's like, this book is super complex. It's for really older readers. Yeah. And so I asked my teacher and he's like, yeah, the story itself is complex, but yeah. the writing and language it, it uses is much more simple. Right. Which to be fair, yeah, looking at Dune, it is a bit more simply written in terms of sentences. Like, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. And it really is a shame because... Eh, either way, I got to read. I got to do it for school, anyways. I had to do a uh, choose your own book. I I got to be able to do it on a book report that I got to choose the book for, which is really nice. Yes, that is nice, as it should be. Yeah, students should be able to choose their own books. You would think so, right? <laughs> I liked my teacher's thing. It like it was like it's a choose a book, but like be reasonable about it. Yeah, take Dr. Seuss. Don't take a graphic novel, just take a book. And so, yeah, my uh, my my class had a lot of really interesting books. And hmm, I forget, I think there were a couple that I was like, ooh, maybe I should read that. That's interesting. Okay, but listen, you can't diss graphic novels. I used to. Yeah, graphic novels are great. I had to write one. Um, it's not a novel. It's actually nonfiction. And it's about media literacy for middle schoolers teaching them all the ways that they can discern fake news, they can tell fake news from real news, 
in newspapers, magazines, advertisements, movies, et cetera, it was the hardest book I've ever written. It was so hard to distill these huge concepts into tiny speech bubbles. <laughs> wow, that, yeah, that must have been really hard. Oh, gosh, it was so hard. I had to write like 10 drafts of this book. Ooh. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I was sort of thinking more of like a uh, Hobbit graphic novel. Uh, oh, I have yeah, yeah. I Hobbit know. graphic novel, it's like the size of a comic book. And I know, but if it gets people interested, maybe yeah, yeah. next year they'll pick up the actual book, the novel. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe they'll try and pick up the Lord of the Rings, which. Yeah. Right. Because I do think that the Hobbit novel, oh, the, the illustrations is really why I like it. Because it's like, if I want to turn off my brain with a familiar story, uh -huh. I can just look at pretty pictures. That's a good idea. Yeah, you're right. Huh. Well, ask me anything else that you want. Uh, sorry. Um, how do you feel this book will affect others? And yeah, sorry. Tangents are hard for me. How? That's, oh, let me think about that. Well, you know, honestly, in my, in my idealized version of the world, teachers will pick this book up and use it in their classrooms in conjunction with helping kids to start a project like the one Coach Lipinski does. Um, I would love for this book to empower a whole generation of readers to realize that they they do have power, especially when they cooperate, when they cross pollinate, they actually do have power and agency, especially with social media, to change the world for the better, to get their voices out there, to really affect real transformation. So I hope that I also hope it inspires people to do some more research into Down syndrome as a genetic condition and reach out a hand in friendship. I hope readers will consider volunteering with Special Olympics and the Buddy Walk fundraiser. And I, I really hope, I used to be a special ed teacher way, way back. And we had peer tutors in my class. So I had nine students of varying intellectual and physical disabilities. There was a school next door for kids without disabilities. And we would have several of the third grade students come over to my class to work with my kids and then vice versa, my kids would go over to their class. And there was just so much cooperation and empathy and love. And I would love to catch up with those peer tutors now to find out how their lives were changed by, by those interactions with my students. So that was a super long winded answer to a great question. Uh, thanks. Uh, maybe I should keep myself from tangents, but yeah, so moving on. Uh, what three things do you want people to come away with this? This is sort of tying into the last one. Yeah. Let's see. Well, I would like them to come away with a solid sense of how to be better allies to people who have, for instance, um, speech impediments like Daisy's Lisp, uh, intellectual disabilities like Squirrel's Down Syndrome. There are people in his on his Special Olympics team who are on the autism spectrum. Um, there, there's a bully, obviously. There are, are kids who are being bullied by, by Devin Smalley. So I'm hoping that there's a blueprint for how to be an ally, how to, how to band together against a bully or against prejudice and bigotry and, and have each other's backs and empower each other to stand up against that. You asked me for two more takeaways. I do again really hope that people take away from Daisy, um, oh my gosh, it doesn't matter that I'm 13. I can do this super cool project that came to me at three in the morning. I can do it. I can use the power of TikTok or uh, whatever they're allowed to be on at age 13 and change the world for the better. And I guess this is kind of strange, but I think there's a lot of dystopian 
uh, middle grade fiction out there. A lot of books that that leave kids feeling mm, kind of sad, kind of hopeless. And I hope Daisy Woodworm Changes the World leaves kids feeling a little bit more hopeful and optimistic in a realistic way. Because Daisy's got some super real world problems. Her parents don't have enough money. They had to start a dog poop removal business, but they're they're looking on the bright side. They're having a good time with it, right? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I just, I hope that it, it, I hope kids finish the book and feel happier, more optimistic, cheered up a little bit. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. How often, um, so you've talked about how like, uh, you had other books and yeah, I actually read a bit about them. Um, and I was wondering how often do you draw on your personal experiences to write? Uh, I started out as a memoirist way back when I was in grad school. I didn't mean to be a memoirist, but I was, I, I got into grad school with a fictionalized piece of memoir and my teacher saw right through it. So I, I wrote a couple of memoirs um, and, and then I really wanted to get into fiction instead. I really love fiction. I really love the middle school minds. I just think middle schoolers are fascinating and brave and hilarious. And, and so, yeah, I, I drew on a lot of my experiences for, for both of my middle grade novels. The first one, Avenging the Owl, came out of my eight years uh, rehabilitating uh, orphans, raptors, birds of prey at our local Raptor Center, I actually ended up training owls for several years for educational presentations. So a lot of those owl facts and a lot of the grosser aspects of working to rehabilitate birds of prey made it into Avenging the Owl, along with a lot of the fascinating flora and fauna of the Pacific Northwest. And so a lot of my personal experiences go in there, even if I'm not, you know, one of the characters in the book. Yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, sorry, talking about the flora and fauna of Pacific Northwest reminded yeah. me, banana slugs. Yes! <laughs> um, um, here, slugs are absolutely reviled. You, oh. If you have a slug, it is a pest that is to be immediately taken out. No. They kill people here. What? What? Yeah, uh, here they um, absorb this, what is it, bacteria or, it's rat lungworm disease. It's a type of like bacteria or something that th they can spread onto a plant that will literally kill someone if it's not like properly taken care of. And it is very bad. So a lot of like gardeners will like start putting around like little salt rings or whatever they need to do to keep slugs out of their garden or else it will start like being oh, really bad yeah i had no idea i'm writing this down did you say lungworm yeah rat lungworm oh no okay i'm looking that up as soon as we're done here because i love that kind of scientific fact have you ever licked a banana slug no <laughs> okay i have i had to I had to. Yes, I was teaching a nature writing class at the University of Oregon Journalism School, and we were on a field trip at the coast, and I had been telling them how important it is to evoke all five senses in your nature writing, and along comes the slug, and they dared me to lick it, so I did. <laughs> That's really interesting and also kind of gross. It is gross. Hey, wait a minute. You ate grasshoppers. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But like... <laughs> Slime is always one of my more, I want to stay away from slime. <laughs> I see your point though. Yeah, yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah, okay, moving on. Sorry, uh, what was it? Has writing the book helped you through any tough times or did you reflect on any tough times that you had while you were writing it? Yeah, oh, are you by any chance gonna be a journalist in your profession? Actually, I'm not really looking towards that I okay. might I might go for writing but I might but my real dream is to go into aerospace engineering and building mm -hmm. rockets that's much more lucrative uh but these these questions are are really thoughtful yes 
the book helped helped me through a really tough time. I I wrote the book directly after my brothers and my mom died of cancer. And she was beloved. We absolutely adored her. She was only 72. It was as, you know, deaths from cancer are horrific, um, totally devastating. She was hilarious the whole time. Um, so that was good. But I wrote this book kind of as a, a love letter to her and a love letter to Ventura, where we had spent so much time when I was a kid. And I sometimes was drafting it and just weeping and thinking, Melissa, why don't you set this in Portland, Oregon, so that you don't cry through every chapter, but it wanted to be Ventura, California. And yeah, and so, you know, my brother was calling me and he was really, really sad because he was living in California. And so the book really acted sort of as therapy to work through a lot of this grief and a lot of this pain. And yeah, so my great grandparents were in the early 1900s circus and vaudeville. They were juggling wire walking comedians. And so my mom grew up with them and she learned to find a sense of humor in the darkest, grimmest things. So when she was dying, she really was hilarious and she made me laugh quite a bit too. And I like to think that a lot of that humor is in Daisy Woodworm changes the world, even as they are broke and they don't even have enough money for soda. I like to think that that sense of whimsy and playfulness is in the book in some places. Yeah, Good definitely. Good question. I have two things to say about that. Okay. One is actually three, sorry. Uh, <laughs> one, I am so sorry for your loss. It's yeah. absolutely horrid. And tying into that, my grandma actually, actually had, um, been diagnosed with cancer recently but she had it was early enough that she was able to get it like removed and wow really lucky for us how what type uh I think it was um uterine I yeah. I forget what exact type it was but yeah that's how my grandma died yeah well good for your grandma go grandma yeah she's really cool uh she I both me and my mom credit her for the reason that my family is super tech forward because even back when she was like in her what was it 20s or something when computers and stuff were coming out she made sure that she knew how to use them how to fix them and all of that stuff like she was it's really interesting I really love my family's history with that stuff that's amazing she wasn't in southern california was she uh she was more like Bay Area around there, and then she moved to Fiji and then here. She sounds, I have to write a note down. She sounds so much like my freshman math teacher who quit teaching math and started an, an Apple store, oh. a franchise, right when computers were coming out. Oh my gosh, that's, yeah, she was cutting edge. Oops, you froze. Yeah, sorry. I'm there was a bit of a, a speaker issue. It moved somewhere. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, my she's really cool. Uh and third, uh actually I remembered something. Um in the book, uh Daisy mentioned that her grandma had to go through chemo. Did that was that like offhand mention inspired by that or yeah, it was. <laughs> That was sharp. Oh my gosh, I forgot all about that. Yeah, yeah, that was directly inspired. That's that's really interesting. Hmm. Uh, okay, next. So in the first place, what actually made you want to start writing? Oh gosh, my mom. <laughs> she was a journalist um, early, early on. She, she, um, gosh. She was the editor of a small newspaper in Oxnard, California. She was writing short stories. And I think I was 10 when um, she saw my interest in her writing and sat me down at her electric typewriter and said, I want you to write a short story and submit it to a magazine. I literally just found this short story a few days ago. It was a story about a girl in a mental institution who befriends a visiting white tiger cub. 
I wrote it. I sent it to Seventeen magazine. It did not get published. But I was so intrigued by this idea that it might get published that I, I was on a roll and I started writing really bad cat poetry, which did get published in Cat Fancy magazine. And then I wrote another short story based on something that had happened in our fifth grade uh, class. And it got published in a national magazine when I was 14. It went to schools all over the US, including mine. And we read it out loud. And I was mortified because I'd used all my classmates' real names. Oh. So <laughs> really, really bad idea. I don't advocate that. So I've been writing uh, basically since I was 10 years old. I took a little break to teach special ed and then I miss writing too much. So I switched jobs. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, I can definitely, I don't know if I could like fully imagine, but like, I think I can, I, I can grasp at least the basics of just like having a story that you wrote be sent into your school and not by you and like just have it be, oh, that would be horrible. I wanted to die. I just don't know what I, and it was all about how we had harassed this poor substitute mm -hmm. teacher who had just had a mastectomy and like the worst bully, I used his real name and he was sitting next to me when our teacher read my short story. I, I had such a crush on him and he never asked me out after that. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's important to note that um, part of my work with, with uh, tweens and teens is helping them to find ways to publish their work. And there are so many different places that will publish the work of, of young writers from you know the age of six to 18. And so one of the places I tell people to go is newpages.com. There's a tab specifically for young writers that lists all the magazines and all the writing contests for kids and teens. And I just feel like you might as well start getting your work out there and join the public discourse and start inspiring people, you know, sooner rather than later. And one thing that that kids don't know is that the op ed pages of newspapers they are hungry for young people's voices. They don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from young people who are, you know, going to be the most affected by climate change and the most affected by the racism and other bigotry that's going on right now. And and so I just want to I just want to tell people that you shouldn't not write a letter to the editor or an op-ed because you're 13 you should write it and you should tell the editor how old you are you would be surprised at how much they're going to welcome your voice in the newspaper okay i'm off my soapbox now that's actually really cool uh maybe i should uh put that down uh newpages.com was it yeah. right yep my oh i was Trying to figure out how many questions were. Oh yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Sorry. Uh, there. Okay. Thanks for that uh, information. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, moving on. Uh, let's see. What was it? What sort of stuff have you learned in the world of like writing and publishing novels? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. Well, I really like those those writers who are not afraid to play with format. There was a book that came out a couple of years ago called The First Rule of Punk. I think it was set in the 80s, right when zines were all the rage. Maybe it was the 90s. Um, when was punk? <laughs> and part of the book was a zine. Like periodically, suddenly there'd be a zine. And there are books that include text exchanges. I like those kind of graphic elements in novels to break up the text. I like a lot of what Catherine Applegate writes, especially a book called Wish Tree and Kate DiCamillo's Flora and Ulysses. The one uses illustrations. The other has, again, lots and lots of comic book panels. So that is really exciting. I loved Wonder. I loved RJ Palacio's Wonder. Uh, I don't know if you read it, but how yeah. each of the 
the people, not just Augie, not just, you know, the main protagonist, but Augie's sister, mother, father, the bully, the best friend, everybody had a perspective, a voice, a chapter, so that we really got this overall picture of what it's like for this boy with a severe facial disfigurement to go to a, to go to school, to go to a, I think it was a private school, but yeah. nevertheless, a classroom. Yeah, I just think, I think she opens big doors for people to write about various disabilities. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you've read this, but I actually remember bringing up that we watched Wonder, like I read Wonder at, mm -hmm. at like fourth grade or something. I don't yeah. know. Uh, and then we watched it as a class later on in like sixth grade, oh. eighth grade actually. And I remember my mom was like, I wrote it. My mom actually wrote a art, what was it, article or blog post about the movie and how it was kind of bad. Like it oh, was, it involved, it. yeah, the the movie was, the movie inherited some issues, some of the issues with the movie were inherited from the book uh -huh. and like sort of weird storytelling uh, ideas. And some of them were just innate to the movie. Like, I think, yeah, the writing in the book was really interesting and really cool. And the way they she did it was it was cool. But um, yeah, the way, like, uh, I'm sort of just puppeting, uh, what is it, parroting my mom. Oh, no, that's uh, yeah, great. Yeah, she made a note that the, what was it, the, the movie one didn't have a disabled actor playing Augie. It really? had a, yeah, they had a very quote unquote normal looking kid who they just put a ton of makeup on mm. to play Augie. Bad. Yeah, that wasn't good. Bad either. idea. And then sad. Ugh. Yeah. And then this was more at the actual story, how the award Augie gets at the end, he has he gets an award for like good spirit or something. Huh. And my mom was like, why didn't they just say he gets an award for being like really gifted in science, which is something that he is. He's gifted uh -huh. in and they don't give him an award for that. They just give him an award for that is very clearly, we're giving you an award for coming to school with disabilities. Oh no. Yeah. Is that in the book? I think it was. Actually. Oh no. That's right. <laughs> Isn't he like a scientific genius? Yeah, it's Crazy. Oh, I need to read this piece that your mom wrote. It's actually, yeah, I really liked it. I'll skip um, the movie though. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, have you ever heard of Sia's music? The, it was a, it was like a, what was it? Sia, the music artist decided, I want to make a movie about people with autism. And it was not only in conjunction with Autism Speaks, which is Autism Speaks. Oh, God, Autism Speaks. I could go on a 10-hour long tangent just about Autism Speaks and the horrors of oh, Autism no, Speaks. Oh, really? But also, uh, she, I don't think she had anybody with actual autism oh. in the writing. The actress who played the character with autism did not have autism and oh. actually got worried that the way she was playing the character with autism was too stereotypical. And then Sia was like, no, 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 don't worry. I'll protect you. Oh. It oh. Just. Oh, I had no idea. There's a lot. Um, yeah, there's probably too many books that are representation without, uh, what would it be? No idea, no stories about us without us, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that was actually something that was in relation to uh, Autism Speaks. They, because it was like, the, it's this big uh, fundraiser charity organization. Yeah. For autism. Uh -huh. That has zero people with actual autism on the board. A lot of it actually goes to like, profit for the founder somehow oh uh and also they just do a lot of fear mongering like they had this one very infamous this is autism ad hmm. and it was like 
I will, and it's like all of these like facts about autism. Like if you have a stable relationship, I will ruin it. Oh, it's just horrid. What? And they put that, and they are the leading experts and like leading fundraiser for autism. They just wow, Ugh. really a shame. Uh, sorry, I got really off topic, uh, but I remember this one book that I really liked. Uh, it was Hello Universe? Yes, yeah, Hello I love that one. Yeah, that was really cool. Uh, I read it for a Newberry Club, and I actually got to meet the author <laughs> in person for the, uh, thing. We, my team won fourth place, and oh. we got to get, and I got, like, a little signed copy of, what was it? Is that Aaron, Aaron Entrada Kelly? Yeah, it was and really cool. Yeah, and the boy is, he falls down a well? Yeah. That book is fantastic. Again, you get that multiple perspectives, right? Yeah, exactly. I love that, and yeah. I forget the exact book, but I have a signed copy of it somewhere in oh, my house. Oh, wow. And it was really cool because it also had like the whole uh, text bubbles in the uh, thing. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was really cool. Ah, oh, love that, Arthur. That's that's great. Uh, moving on, because that was a massive side tangent that that's I just... Right. Uh, do you have any tips for up-and-coming writers? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. How much time do you have? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, it was scheduled for about an hour, but I think we can go... Oh, that's okay. Long. I have to I have to pick up my daughter from dance in, in like... 10 minutes, but okay, so I'll condense. First of all, though, I have a new TikTok in which I offer tips for emerging up and coming writers. And it's at Wild Melissa Hart, um, Instagram too. But so I have so many tips. Oh my gosh. I think the most important one, there's a concept called free writing, which you and I probably both know. But for those who don't, you set your clock for like 10 minutes or you resolve to write two or three pages either on your laptop or in a notebook and you just either pick a prompt or you just start writing and you don't stop writing for 10 minutes or three pages. You don't cross out. You don't worry about spelling or grammar. You can write absolute awful stuff. But I think if you fill notebooks like that, maybe five or 10 notebooks, you will find your voice as a writer. I just think it's a wonderful way to, to develop your voice and what's on your mind and what you wanna write about. I have probably 20 of these notebooks in my attic. I'm terrified to look at them. I don't wanna know what I wrote when I was 15, but I'm glad I did it. <laughs> um, I also think it's super important to read in the genre that you want to write. So if your deal is poetry, read a lot of poetry. If you want to write fiction about dragons, read fiction about dragons. I, I think it's important that to read as well as writing. Also, and, and I already said this, have confidence. Don't wait to start sending out your work for publication. Uh, you can start as, as young as six years old. So do it. Why, why let somebody else have all the fun of publishing? Why not do it yourself? You might even get paid. Yeah. Uh, what was it? The Outsiders uh, oh. was a book that we had, that we were reading in my English class. Yeah. Uh, that was also published by like a, she was 15. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 15, yeah. Aragon. Which is so cool. And it was a really good book. Yeah. Aragon. I don't know if you read it. Um, I wasn't it. I think I watched the movie. Christopher Paolini. I think he was 15. Mm. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, bringing it back to the free time, free write in less time. Uh, I remember I took an acting class that had sort of like that, but like not writing at all. It was just, I'll give you 10 minutes, one prompt and four teams, and you got to make skits. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, oh. I, one of our prompts was the life and death of a snowman. Or snow oh my God. <laughs> and let's see, what was it? One of them was like, a snow person that was brought to life. I was like, finally, me and my king can bring domination to the world. <laughs> like this snow person crawling in me, like, help me. And then he's like, oh, well, bro, what is happening to you? And then someone comes in and there's summertime with like a gun. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I was in theater all through high school. You make me miss it. Theater's great. It is. Um, it's the best. We have, I'm so lucky that my school is actually sort of specialized in theater. We have our own, like, what is it? Palk, uh, Performing Arts Learning Center. And it is amazing. I love it so much. Wow. The teachers are great. Uh, it's super fun. We have, it goes on every semester. We put on a play at the end of it. And it's super fun. Cause like you are, you get a part. It's everything. It's really cool. And I love that. It's unique, it's unique to my school. And <laughs> anyone from other schools can be like, hey, if you're in a Hilo, Haido, uh, school, come in. You can, yeah, we've had like our, we just put on a production of A Susified Christmas Carol. And yeah, it was like a really fun. And our Scrooge was actually from a homeschool. I oh. got the part of Bob Cratchit as a side note. I'm oh, very, really? Yeah. How was that? It was fun. I got to play a scared British person when, <laughs> yeah, I actually found other recordings of it and he, I did not like the way they played Bob Cratchit. He had this one line where it's like, uh, I'm sorry, sir. I was just warming my digits. And I played it like very much like, he's going to kill me. He's going to. And then like the one that I found was like, uh, I'm sorry, sir. I was just warming my digits. And I was um, like, that's not a scared British person. That is a, no. that is a six-year-old. I think you're going to have to see the Muppets version. Yeah, I did. And I actually painted my nails uh, <laughs> green, specifically because, you know, Kermit. And oh! I was going to have like this giant green bow tie because it was a Susie Christmas Carol. <laughs> uh, but we weren't able to get that uh, in time. You can't see this, but <laughs> he sits on my uh, desk. <laughs> this was my grandma's. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> He's missing an eye. My dog ate it. He also doesn't uh, smell a, very good. <laughs> Gonna go over there. <laughs> that's really cool. Uh, yeah. Um, before we have, I think, before we have to like end this. Uh, what's your next project? Or if um, you have, well, well, that is the question, isn't it? I think it's a historical novel based on the lives of my great grandparents in the circus and vaudeville. But I'm, I'm going to New York in two days and I'm having lunch with my agent and we're gonna talk about several projects. And so we'll see which one she would like me to work on and I will get back to you. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Uh, sorry, I feel the need to actually share the recording because we got it recorded by uh, my school's other really cool thing that we're specialized in. We have a really, really good AV club. Oh. Um, I think I can use chat. Um, oh, that would be incredible. It's a, um, that's the YouTube channel. Uh, uh -huh. They have, it's a lot more like unstructured content on there. That's like the unofficial thing that they had to put there because we didn't technically, because uh, hush hush, we didn't get the licenses for the music in some of that part. So. I got it, okay. But yeah, we got the Susify Christmas Carol slime tutorial there. It was really fun. Oh. I really love being part of that. Oh, thank you so much. I will watch this right after I look up slugs that give people lung worm. Uh, actually, maybe I should write that fully out. Uh, rat lung worm. Rat? Rat? Yeah, rat lung worm. Because this it's getting uh, better and better. Okay. It's a thing that like rats poop out and then the slugs absorb it, and then they go, and then they spread the slime onto the leaves. It's really disgusting, but So yeah. do, you, do you ever listen to the Ologies podcast? Ologies, uh, no, it's sorry. My, uh, best. I don't work all that well with- With auditory. auditory, yeah, yeah. I think she's got transcripts, but it is, it is just one episode after another full of this, crazy nature stuff and I love it uh sorry what was it again? Uh, Ology, ologies I'll put it in the chat yeah and there are transcripts oh that's why that's not working my uh 
There we go. Okay. Rats, one worm. What a find! <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Uh, I hope you can, uh, I hope you learn about it and I hope you have actually kind of a fun time if you can. Oh, I will. <laughs> Yeah, maybe my next project is nonfiction science book for kids. I am a little bit obsessed with something called slime molds. Do you have those in Hawaii? Uh, I don't know. We, I don't really know. You would maybe. know. You would know. They're not fungus. They're not lichen. They're sort of an entity unto themselves. They pop up in the Pacific Northwest after a rain all sorts of different colors and shapes, and scientists have trained them to do mazes. They love oatmeal. So they will actually oh. slide their way through a maze to get to a single oat flake. I might write a book about slime molds. That's really cool. I, I think I read about that in this one uh, learning thing I had in fourth grade, I think fourth or fifth grade. I'll send you a great video about them. <laughs> Yeah, that's really cool. Thanks for the recommendation. Sure, slime molds. Yay. <laughs> All I right, I should go pick that. up my kid. Yeah. Well, anyways, it was great talking to you. You as well. This is the most fun interview I have done for Daisy. You're the best. Thank you. <laughs> uh, make sure to have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye, Micah. Bye. Don't worry.